Welcome to Accessibility Now, stories about accessibility in Georgia. Accessibility Now is a podcast produced by the Statewide Independent Living Council of Georgia. I'm your host, Desi Gillespie, and for this episode, we continue our tour of Georgia Sills with an interview with Garrick Scott, Executive Director of Multiple Choices. From their location in Athens, near the University of Georgia, they serve a rural 10-county area of Northeast Georgia. But since our feature of Multiple Choices comes through Garrick's perspective, we should start with him from the beginning. Here he is, telling us the course of his life that led him to start working in disability resources and ultimately at Multiple Choices. My story goes back to uh, Warner Robins, Georgia, where I'm originally from. Uh, I was born with a hereditary eye disease called retinitis pigmentosis. It is a deterioration of the pulmonary rods within the retina. I am the only one in my family who was born with it. And, and in theory, it should have been all of my siblings because we all have the same parents. When I was around 18, my vision deteriorated to where it is now. And so I have little to no usable vision. Uh, in fact, now I have very minimal light perception. At this point in my life, only the sunlight is bright enough to really bother my eyes or, or affect my eyes in any way. I graduated from high school and through the foresight of the teachers and the principal and the staff at my high school, I was connected with VR uh, vocational rehabilitation at that time, but it is now the Georgia Vocational Rehabilitation Agency, GVRA. And they suggested that I go to the Georgia Academy for the Blind right after high school so that I could learn to use a cane and learn Braille and a variety of other blindness skills. So I did. Once I lost my sight, I had no aspirations to go to college or anything of that nature. But what the school realized, they they had students who were learning to make those wicker chairs, and they call it caning. They were making those wicker chairs. And so they said, all right, well, you don't want to go to college. We'll, we'll try you at this. And they gave me a baby chair. And to this day, I still never finished that chair. I was awful. <laughs> I probably went down in history as the worst caner they ever had. And they said, you can't do this. I, I still wasn't going to go to college. But what they did do is recognize that I was a, a very good speaker. So when they had prospective parents come with their students, they would assign me to take them on a tour. That's when one of the teachers pulled me to the side and said, you, you see you have natural talent. So that sparked me going ahead and applying, and I went off to college, and I won't belabor that. But that was the beginning of people seeing something in me that I didn't see in myself. So then I, I had the pleasure of attending Gardner-Webb University, which is a, a Baptist college in Boiling Springs, North Carolina. And I graduated with a degree in communications. Now, punk graduating, I thought, oh, man, I have a college degree. Now all I have to do is go apply for jobs and people are going to give me a chance. And that was not the case, especially as a, a blind adult. I had a, a lot of rejections and I was unemployed. And one day a woman called me. We, we were associates. I wouldn't say we were friends. And she was in this AmeriCorps program. And I'd never heard of AmeriCorps. But Someone told her in the blind community, call Garrett Scott. He's looking for a job because she was going to be unable to take part in the program, but they weren't going to let her leave without a replacement because they'd already invested money in it. So she found another blind person, me. I wasn't doing anything, so I said, sure, I'll do it. Then I get some money, and I was assigned to Disability Link, which is the seal in Atlanta. That was my first exposure to the disability community, the history of the disability movement, etiquette with PCAs, etiquette with someone in a wheelchair, people first language, all of that. 
even as a blind person, I had never been exposed to that sort of thing. I'd never been a part of any group, disability group, in any shape, form, or fashion before then. And after Garrick's first step into the disability community, he stayed busy. Over the years, he worked with the National Federation of the Blind in Georgia as an employee of Newsline and then as president. At the same time, he became chair of Disability Link, and after both terms were up, he started working as director of the youth department at Disability Link. Then, in January of 2022, Garrick got an unexpected endorsement for the position he now holds. The then executive director of Multiple Choices, her name is um, Ms. Robin Oliver, passed away. And unbeknownst to me, she had created a succession plan. And in her succession plan, she told the board, I don't know if he would accept the position, but you all should find Garrett Scott and ask him if he wants it. His passion for the disability community and his creativity would could greatly be a benefit to multiple choices. And hearing that from the board chair when he, he, cause he didn't know me, he had to figure out how to track down my number. But even hearing about that will go down as one of the top three most humbling things that has ever happened to me in my life. To get, not to be morbid, but to get a recommendation from someone from the grave was uh, both eerie and humbling and uh, uh, honor. H- has there been ups and downs? Yeah, there were ups and then there were a lot of downs, but there are much more ups now. And the thought of having the final word on making a decision that could potentially impact hundreds of people who, with disability, their lives, is something I take very, very serious. Very, very serious. You know, uh, I'll be completely frank. I don't think SEALs as a whole embrace the blind community. Uh, Rarity here in Georgia, two of the directors are blind, myself and Christina Holsclaw in Rome, and that's a rarity in itself. Nine seals and two of them being to be blind. And I appreciate that and, and I respect that. I just don't think there are programs geared toward the blind and include the blind and support the blind at, at seals as a whole. And I, I just like being able to do so. And, and I don't solely do programs for the blind. Our, our programs are always open to the disability community as a whole, but I just make sure that there are going to be accessibility needs meant for the blind so they can sit there next to someone who may have a cognitive disability or a physical disability, and they can engage each other as peers and, and enjoy the event as close to equally as possible. So the one thing that fuels me is I don't want to make a mistake because there were some talented people that preceded me. And it is, it is my responsibility to make sure that their hard work, their sweat and tears doesn't go in vain, that I build upon what it is that they created. At first, being more familiar with urban service areas, Garrick hesitated to move to multiple choices. But now, he's comfortable with the unique challenges of rural disability services, and multiple choices has creative strategies to solve them. When we offer services, we have to go to the people a little more than, than other seals would. They can say, well, we can set up this appointment with you and you can take public transportation to get to us. We are probably the one of the only exceptions in Georgia in that we have two accessible vans. So we're able to go pick up the patron and bring them to our uh, brick and mortar and then they can go through the process and they can participate in events. Or if we're doing something somewhere in one of the 10 counties we serve, we can pick people up and bring them to the area so they can participate. So that makes it a little easier. And we weren't, we had the vans, but we weren't using them in that capacity before I got here. So uh, that's one thing that's unique that we really, we really had to rely on now. I know people are thinking, but you're there where the university of Georgia is and, and they have all kinds of funding that they can support you. 
I need people to recognize that if we're asking UGA for funding of any type, just think how many people start their own nonprofit organization with that same thought process. It doesn't work like that. They're, they're a major, major university. They really have to be mindful of who and where they hitch their wagon. Have they partnered with us? Have they given us a, 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 a permission to put their logo on our flyer that, to show that we partnered with them in a variety of events? Yes, which was major. Which was major for them to allow us to do that. I, I think it becomes incumbent upon us because we are a rural area and because we only have public transportation in a very limited area in Athens to think outside of the box. And because of the, the rural area we're in and the, the, the specific characteristics to the 10 counties that we serve here, multiple choices, when it comes to housing, we start talking to people about roommates and splitting the cost instead of the thought process of, I can't afford to, to I want to live here because it's a safe area, but I can't afford $1,500 rent by myself, as opposed to finding a two bedroom, two bath, and you split the cost with someone else who's in a similar situation. It's just that side of thinking outside the box helps us to serve our consumers that much better. And I'm constantly challenging the team here to figure out, okay, this way isn't working. What is something outside of the box that we could do in this regard? And one of the things that we came up with was partnering with uh, the library. Uh, so we partnered with all the libraries in our surrounding 10 counties. In fact, on Valentine's Day, we had a talent show. And it encompassed people from all 10 counties and, and all the libraries were included. And it was a major success since I came up with the idea and only gave the staff and, and the librarians participating a month to put it together. It was an amazing turnout. It was an amazing turnout. And I'm not saying that to tout what we do. I mean, or anything that we've done, but to say it's going to take that side, that type of thinking to bring people into what we do, make them feel comfortable with wanting to be a part of what we do, and even get those individuals who have disabilities wanting to be consumers with us because they recognize that we see them as individuals and we want them to live their best life. Events like the talent show are important to that idea, helping people live their best life in community. Here's Garrick about more of the events put on by Multiple Choices. On that first bingo event we did, there were 50 people. And what we wanted to show is that the disability community will come out. If they have a way to get there, they, they like to have fun too. They like to win <laughs> and they love prizes. And we partner with the libraries because we need them to see just by posting a flyer on your bulletin board is not going to cause someone with a disability to come out. I said, how would I know if, if I were a blind person, how am I to know that flyer is there? If I, as a blind person, how am I getting there? Even if I hear about it word of mouth as a person with a physical disability, what accommodations are you making for me? Are, are there spaces at the table that don't have chairs in every spot so that I can so I can pull up to the table as well? So having these events is causing the library to start thinking about their procedures. And accessibility is much more than electric doors or ramp. It's much, much more than that. We actually are going to teach people in June at the uh, Auburn Library. Uh, in Barrow County of this way, everyone's going to learn how to salsa dance by using Braille. We're excited about that. We're absolutely excited about that. So people say, ah, how's a person in a wheelchair going to dance? That's not for us to determine. They figure that out for themselves. 
if they if they just turn their chair to the left or the right, they're dancing, they're having fun. And it doesn't have to be the same way that you like it. I have a brother who eats grits just like I do, except he puts ketchup on his grits and his eggs, which I think is hideous. <laughs> and I'm not going to yuck someone else's yum, but if the music is there, how I enjoy the music and how you enjoy the music, they don't have to be the same. But if we just invite somebody, hey, we're going to be playing some music, won't you come with us and, and enjoy it? That's all we have to do. That's all we're mandated to do. And you know what happens? These people meet other people with disabilities in this community that they didn't know existed. And they're creating their own circle of support. They're creating their own peer-to-peer -peer support. And I literally seen it happen. I've, I've seen one gentleman talk to another in a wheelchair. How do you do this with your PCA? Or where do you go when, when your PCA calls out? And they're helping each other. And they don't have to come to us. And they're exchanging phone numbers. That, that is a beautiful thing. That's what the objective is with us holding these different events in a variety of places throughout the, the counties here. Some at the libraries, some here at our location. But it, it's all about giving people an opportunity to be who they want to be. And of course, in pursuit of that, multiple choices does nursing home transition to. And even there, they found their own way to put a creative spin on it. One of our drivers that we have contract with is going to be delivering equipment to this person who's transitioning and groceries. So uh, my staff, they didn't, the groceries weren't delivered to a place, so they went to pick them up and they're going to bring them back so he could take the groceries and the equipment to this lady all in one trip. So <laughs> that's what was going on. I was doing a final coordination for that. But the opportunity, the ability for us to be able to support people, again, in this rural area, who have a place to be able to get back to their place and help them get back on their feet. I can't put into words how it helps those people really get back in the swing of things with their lives. What we were finding out and what we're finding, a number of them don't know that we offer this service. And so my staff goes out on Fridays and they will go to different nurses. So I just, just want you to know if this is something you want to do. We're here to help you. We're here to support you. And we've gotten a couple of people who have contacted us and said, I want to get out. I didn't know I could. I, I didn't I didn't know how I would get furniture again. And, you know, I even had the foresight to create a partnership with Badcock Furniture here. So if they need new furniture, we can get that as well. So it, it, the program is paying dividends much more so for the community. You know, you know how the program works. We do receive some financial compensation, but it, it pales in comparison to the feeling we get of helping someone be back their privacy of their own homes and, and living their lives, which is always the the theme of what we do here. It, it is our responsibility to change what it means to have a disability in these 10 counties we serve. And as someone with a disability and a professional advocate for disability rights, Garrick still experiences ableism, well-meaning or otherwise, in his position as executive director at Multiple Choices. Getting people's attitudes right is as key a part of equality for the disability community as providing the resources of a SIL, he said. I've had a couple of instances where people will automatically just try to do something because they see someone with a disability and not include them or ask them even if that's what they want to do. And the social movement comes in when, when you do that sort of thing to someone, you've already placed yourself on a pedestal above them. When, when you decide this is what they need without even ever including them, that, that's a hierarchy. That becomes an instant hierarchy. And, and people may say, oh, you're being dramatic. Well, I, I will be a part of the royal drama family then because I can be a drama king when it comes to that sort of thing. Socially, we need people to recognize the difference between sympathy and empathy. And when you decide, oh, I need to do this. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. When those sort of phrases are coming out of your mouth, then you're being sympathetic. But when someone 
is blind and they may not walk directly to the door and they may go to the left and then get to some point and then go to the right towards the door and you just say, oh, they got it. They're not going to do it exactly the way you do or a person with a physical disability may use a grabber to pick something up off the floor and they don't need you running around. Oh, I got it. I'll pick it up for you. For them to be in their mind as independent as possible does so much more for their psyche and their ability and their desire to want to do something else. I want to pick up something else. I want to do something else. I want to move something else. I want a job doing this. This is what I really like to do. And I don't think people recognize how socially, even if we take two steps forward, when they don't embrace it, they are literally pulling us back three steps. The work required to change our society like that starts with everyone. And at multiple choices, Garrick said, everyone really does mean everyone. If you are in one of the 10 counties, we serve multiple choices, which would include Barrow, Park, Elbert, Green, Jackson, Morgan, Madison, Oconee, Oglethorpe, and Walton. The doors are open. If you're not in one of those counties, but you need help, the doors are open. If you are a member of another seal in another state, our doors are open. This is a team effort. And it doesn't matter what state you live in. It doesn't matter what county you live in. It doesn't matter what city you live in. If you are part of the disability community as an ally or as a person with a disability, our doors are open. This cannot and will not happen without all of us working together. Thank you, Garrett, and thanks to everyone at Multiple Choices. And thank you for listening to Accessibility Now, stories about accessibility in Georgia. Accessibility Now is a podcast produced by the Statewide Independent Living Council of Georgia. If you want to find out more about that organization, you can visit us at silkga.org. That's S-I-L-C-G-A dot O-R-G. This has been your host, Desi Gillespie, and I just want to close by reminding you that a Georgia that includes everyone is better for all of us.